Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Help us keep this podcast going. Become a supporter of American Catholic History at AmericanCatholicHistory.locals.com or Patreon.com slash American Catholic History. We've got some great perks for supporters, including interviews, gifts, live discussions, videos of places that we travel to, like now we're recording from St. Benedict Abbey in Massachusetts, and even items that we pick up while we're on our travels. For more information, visit our website, AmericanCatholicHistory.org. Also, be sure to give us a five-star rating and a great review at Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. These help others to find us. Today, we're talking about Father Francis Sampson, an army chaplain who parachuted into Normandy in the wee hours of D-Day. He was also the man behind the events that inspired Steven Spielberg's war epic, Saving Private Ryan. But what he did in that episode was not the most epic part of his story. Right. The story in the film was significantly embellished, even if the underlying point was the same. But like you say, his work on that case was not even close to the most awe-inspiring part of his service. No, his work with the wounded and dying in the days after D-Day are far more harrowing. He was even nominated for the Congressional Medal of Honor for those actions. He didn't get the Blue Max, however, because of an unwritten rule about non-combatants being ineligible for the military's highest honor. All of this came after he literally didn't know what he was getting himself into when he signed up for paratrooper school. When he did realize what it meant, it was too late to back out. Well, it was too late for him to back out. Right. Someone else may have, but he was the sort who, once he set his hand to the till, did not look back. And it was that dedication to duty, to doing the right thing that was in front of you, that would be so important for his boys following D-Day. But not just D-Day. He was a beloved chaplain throughout World War II, jumping during Operation Market Garden and then being in the Battle of the Bulge, and then as a prisoner of war for the last few months of the war. Okay, so... Let's tell his story. Absolutely. He was born on Leap Day, February 29th, 1912, in Cherokee, Iowa. He was a good athlete growing up, and he attended the University of Notre Dame, graduating in 1936. He entered seminary for the Diocese of Des Moines and was ordained a priest in June of 1941. Within a year, he asked his bishop for permission to become an army chaplain. His bishop consented, and Father Sampson reported to chaplain school, which was done at Harvard University at the time. When he completed the five-week chaplain school, he volunteered to fill the need for airborne chaplains. As we said, at the time, he didn't fully appreciate what this would mean. He just saw that there was a need, and he said, Like a zealous young businessman starting in a strange town, I was ready to join anything out of a sheer sense of civic duty. But, he said, Frankly, I didn't know when I signed up for the Airborne that chaplains would be expected to jump from an airplane in flight. <laughs> well, he found out really quickly. He shipped to Fort Benning, Georgia, the home of paratrooper school, and he went through the grueling training. He was athletic, but this training punishes the strongest and most fit men. And beyond the grueling training is just the inherent danger in falling from the sky and running into the ground or whatever you happen to be blown into. Father Sampson nearly drowned during one jump when he ended up in the Chattahoochee River. When he successfully completed paratrooper school, he was sent to the 501st Airborne Regiment, which was part of the 101st Airborne Division, the famous Screaming Eagles. He became a quick favorite among the men for his dedication to them. He was humorous, accessible, and good-natured. He quickly acquired a nickname, Father Sam. But his relations with the regimental commander weren't so warm. Colonel Howard Johnson, no mention of whether he had red hair, was a rough and profane man. He was excellent at preparing a fighting force, serving ice cream, no, that's a joke, but Father Samson believed he was overly profane. Father Sam voiced his disapproval of the colonel's language. The colonel wasn't receptive to this correction, and relations between the two men were strained. 
Father Sam went through combat medic training, skills which would come in very handy before the 500 first shipped out to England in January 1944. Upon arrival in England, the already strained relations between Father Sam and Colonel Johnson exploded when Father Sam found out that Johnson had required the men to carry condoms with them when they went out on leave. Johnson even kept a big bowl of them where the men could help themselves. Father Sam could not abide this assault on the conscience rights of his Catholic troops and the attack on the moral uprightness of the rest of the troops. He confronted the colonel who barked at him, you take care of their souls, chap. I'll take care of their butts. So the colonel just didn't get it. Ah, uh, no. And the chaplain would not let this one go. He sent the matter up the chain and rode home, admitting that his opposition on this matter might cost him his job. Well, word finally came back down in favor of the chaplain's case. The colonel had to drop his requirement, and the big bowl of prophylactics went away. Score one for religious liberty and conscience rights. D-Day came on June 6, 1944. The night before, June 5th, Father Sam was among the 13,348 paratroopers who boarded 821 planes to fly over the English Channel and drop behind enemy lines. Father was armed with a mass kit, hosts, prayer cards, oils for anointing, one canteen filled with sacramental wine, another filled with medicinal alcohol, and a first aid kit. Aboard the plane, Father led the men, somber and quiet, in a prayer. As his plane flew over the channel, he saw the massive fleet of Navy ships, more ships than he could count. They crossed into French airspace, and the anti-aircraft fire made a tremendous and deadly fireworks display all around. Bullets pierced their own plane. One man was hit, but not badly. Father's turn to jump came. As he left the aircraft and his parachute deployed, he surveyed his surroundings, suspended in the air with bullets whizzing past, and he marveled that any of them survived at all. He then collapsed part of his chute to accelerate his descent and put his life in the hands of his guardian angel. Well, his guardian angel didn't let him die, but it was a near-run thing. He landed in a deep, flooded drainage ditch and was nearly drowned. He managed to cut himself free, then had to go back in and dive for his mass kit and sacred essentials, which were at the bottom of the ditch. He and some other members of the 501st found each other. They witnessed three transport planes get shot down and crash, and they prayed for the souls of the crew. Then they made their way to a larger group that had coalesced around the town of Bas Adeville. Father Sam found the aid station there with about a dozen wounded guys in it who clearly could not move or be moved. But the rest of the paratroopers in Bas Adeville were leaving the village that night to head to the main rallying point some miles away at La, La Barquette. The intention was to leave the severely wounded to the mercy of the Germans, who would undoubtedly retake Bas Adeville once the Americans had left. The Germans might leave those wounded men alone, recognizing that they were too badly wounded to do anything, or they might just execute them all. But the officer in charge had to move out with his able-bodied men to join up with the main fighting force. Father Sam informed the officers that he was staying behind. They tried to talk him out of it, but he would not leave those men when they needed him most. That night, the unit moved out, and Father Sam and Private Fisher, who was a trained medic, remained behind to tend to the dozen or so wounded and to face the coming Germans. Father Sam organized the wounded in various spaces and went about with Private Fisher administering what aid they could to keep the men comfortable and keep their wounds from becoming infected. Among the wounded was a soldier named Norman Dick, who had one of his grenades go off in his pocket, destroying his leg. They had more or less staunched the bleeding, but there was little hope of saving his life in those conditions. That night, Father Sam spent much time sitting with Norman Dick, giving him plasma transfusions, comforting him, and listening to him reminisce about his family. He had lost both parents during the Great Depression, and he had made his way as a carpenter before being drafted. Norman Dick died about 3.30 a.m. in Father Sam's arms. After a short prayer service, Father Sam and Private Fisher wrapped him in a parachute and placed him outside the cottage. The next day, it took the Germans a while to realize that the Americans were not in Bass Adeville any longer. Around 10.30 or 11, the Germans finally approached the small aid station. Father Sam, in an effort to prevent the Germans from just riddling the old cottage with machine gun fire, went out with a white flag. Two young German soldiers immediately took him prisoner and marched him about a quarter mile to a hedgerow where they put him against a wall to shoot him. As he realized what was about to happen, he became so nervous that, rather praying the act of contrition, he found himself praying grace before meals. 
bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts. Exactly. <laughs> I, you know, I can kind of understand that. <laughs> yeah. As he stood there awaiting the bullets, he finally heard a gunshot, but he realized that he had not been shot. Instead, he found that a German non-commissioned officer had fired over the head of the young soldiers to stop them. He had just come around the corner and quickly assessed the situation and recognized the atrocity of summarily executing an Allied officer. And then he realized that Father Sam was a Catholic priest and he shoved the soldiers away. He too was Catholic. He showed Father Sam the Sacred Heart medal he kept under his jacket, as well as pictures of his children and his wife. This German NCO, whose English was not great, took Father Sam to a nearby German officer who had a translator. After a quick interrogation, they determined that he really was who he said he was, and he was not a threat. Father Sam told them about his aid station and the 13 wounded men inside. They assured him that his aid station would not be targeted by them. They would leave him and his wounded men alone. Meantime, hearing the gunshots, the men back at the aid station assumed the worst, that Father Sam was a goner. They were distraught until he walked back through the door. They were so relieved to have Father Sam back. That night, the American forces began their efforts to retake Bass Adaville. The first part of the plan included large amounts of artillery. They didn't know there was still a pocket of Americans hunkered down in a house in one of the sectors of their targeted area. But beginning at midnight, shelling from American artillery made that night a living hell for the men still in the aid station. The ear-splitting sound, the disorientating percussive waves. Some shells fell near enough to rumble the house, shatter windows, and cause plaster to fall from the ceiling. Father Sam did his best to keep the men calm, and he maintained his own poise throughout. One of the men, Private John C. Marney, commented, Father Samson was just as calm as if nothing was happening. Sometime in the morning, a shell finally struck near enough to the aid station to collapse the pantry and kitchen area, fatally injuring the two men who had been put in those rooms for a lack of space elsewhere. Father Sam had thrown himself over three men in the main room to protect them in case the rest of the building crumbled, but the main room remained upright. The American advance came into Bass Adaville around 6 a.m., but like the artillery, the infantry units approaching the town had no idea that this partially destroyed cottage held Americans. American bullets peppered the walls of the cottage during the firefight. One tracer round entered through a window and rattled around before passing through part of Father Sam's pants, catching them on fire. He managed to douse the fire, but not before he suffered second-degree burns. Eventually, the Americans realized that the one building which hadn't been firing back actually held Americans, including many casualties. It took a while longer, but finally, they were all evacuated to an army hospital. Father Sam's longest three days were over. He managed to keep 11 of the 14 men alive. When Colonel Johnson heard of the chaplain's actions, his selflessness and grit, his opinion of that meddlesome priest changed. He recommended Father Sam for the Medal of Honor. And from that point on, no one ever gained as much respect from Colonel Johnson as the priest who stayed behind. Following his harrowing days at Bass Adaville, Father Sam was at a hospital in France where a distraught soldier named Fritz Nyland told Father Sam that he'd learned one of his three brothers had been killed and was buried nearby. He asked Father Sam to take him to the grave. Father Sam did so, but when they got there, they realized, to Nyland's horror, that it was not the brother he'd heard had died. It was another of his brothers. But the original brother had, in fact, been killed. On top of this, Nyland's third brother, had been reported missing after being shot down in the Pacific Theater. Under the Department of Defense's new sole survivor policy, this meant that Fritz had to be removed from the war zone lest his parents lose all four of their sons. Fritz resisted, saying he wasn't going to leave his boys. Father Sam told him, You can take it up with General Eisenhower or President Roosevelt, but you are going home. The lone survivor policy followed on the tragedy of the five Sullivan brothers. They insisted on serving on the same boat, and they all died when their naval vessel, the USS Juno, sank in 1942. Father Sam's adventure with Fritz Nyland, of course, is the real story behind saving Private Ryan. Not as dramatic as the movie, the young man wasn't way out in the middle of France. He was right there in a military hospital. Father Sam jumped into Holland during Operation Market Garden and then was taken prisoner in December of 1944 during the Battle of the Bulge. He and thousands of Allied soldiers were force-marched 185 miles in 10 days from Belgium through Luxembourg and into Germany, where they were loaded into boxcars and taken to a POW camp on the north coast of Germany. 
Through the forest march and for four months in the POW camp, Father Sam was a true shepherd to his men. In the POW camp, he asked to be sent to the part of the camp where the enlisted men went rather than the nicer part where the officers were. He offered mass daily, led prayer services, and administered the sacraments as he could. On Good Friday, 1945, he led the men in the Stations of the Cross. The POW camp was liberated by Soviet troops on April 28, 1945. Father Sam eventually returned to the United States in October of 1945, but he wasn't out of the military long. In July 1946, he rejoined as a regimental chaplain for the 505th Airborne Regiment, which was in the 82nd Airborne Division. With that regiment, he served in Korea until 1951, when he returned to the U.S. After a few other posts within the military chaplaincy, he was elevated to the rank of Major General and made the Chief of Chaplains for the Army in 1967. He served in that post until he retired from the military in 1971. He had earned a Purple Heart, the Distinguished Service Cross, and a host of other medals for his service. And after that, he went back to being a parish pastor. Imagine having a pastor with a history like that. I know, seriously. Come, come up to him and complain, Father, somebody really needs to do a better job scheduling who has which room in the parish hall. <laughs> yeah, or Father, why can't we have... Mm, fill in your own pet Catholic thing here. Right. And Father replies, Oh, that's interesting. Have I told you about the time I was nearly shot by German soldiers and then went back to tending to wounded paratroopers under heavy bombardment by my own artillery? Yeah, that was really something. So what was that you were talking about? <laughs> right. We just, because Father wouldn't have done that. His life was just seeing the thing that needed doing and then doing it. He cared for souls no matter the circumstances. Yeah, he joked that while so many saw him as such a hero figure, he insisted that there was no one in France as frightened of the dangerous situations as he was, that no one's knees would knock as loudly, nor would anyone's heart race as fast. Yeah, but to all outward appearances, he was cool and calm. And that humble way of being was part of why it took another dozen or so years before the question of his Medal of Honor came up. Right. He had intentionally omitted the Medal of Honor nomination from his official memoirs and all published recollections. But in the 1980s, he was involved with ROTC at Notre Dame. One evening, he recounted the story of his time in Bass Attaville to Sergeant Major Francis Boyle, the chief ROTC instructor at Notre Dame. Boyle was so amazed by the story and so shocked that Samson's Distinguished Service Cross hadn't been elevated to a Medal of Honor that he wrote to one of Indiana's senators, Dan Quayle. Quayle looked into the matter, and the long, convoluted answer came back that, though Samson had been recommended for a Medal of Honor, General Marshall, who had discretion in the matter, reduced it to a Distinguished Service Cross, which is the next highest honor, simply because of an unwritten rule in place at that time that non-combatants, like chaplains and medics, could not merit a Medal of Honor. The rule was unfortunate, and by the end of the war, medics, though not yet chaplains, were being awarded the Medal of Honor. And then, by the end of the 1960s, the rule was set aside entirely. For one, Father Vince Camparano, who we talked about in a previous episode, was awarded the Medal of Honor in 1969 for his sacrifice in Vietnam in 1967. And then in 2013, Father Emil Capon received the Medal of Honor posthumously for his sacrifice way back in 1950 in Korea. So there's precedent. Yes. But according to the military brass, there were circumstances about how the process was handled in Samson's case that made it impossible for his case to be reopened and reviewed for an elevation of his Distinguished Service Cross to a Medal of Honor. But as Father Samson no doubt knew, the honor of the Medal of Honor wasn't the point. And it certainly isn't the goal. Yeah, in a way, earning a Medal of Honor may have been a burden to him. More is expected of, of MOH recipients. He would have had a harder time living his final years in relative obscurity, using his investments and pension to support many, many charitable causes. And he knew that the men whose lives he saved physically and certainly spiritually were the more important reward. And he certainly had many of those. Yes. This has been American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media. If you enjoy American Catholic History, become a supporter on Locals or Patreon. Get information about both and the perks of being a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also, on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about Father Samson, see our upcoming pilgrimages, and find other episodes. And be sure to check out our sponsor, Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. 
We love getting your feedback and suggestions for episodes. You can email us at feedback at americancatholichistory.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow us on Twitter at ACH1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media.